Picture a dreamer that was dreaming she was locking down in a bog, foul smells meeting her nostrils, slimy fish wriggling against her legs, and as sometimes happens in dreams, suddenly found herself transported to a beautiful, bright city with intricate towers and spires rising to the sky and gold-gilded palaces adorning the streets. This video was produced by Dharma Realm Buddhist University. We are always putting out videos, free online events, articles, and courses. So if you enjoy this type of content, click the link in the description to sign up for a newsletter. This video is going to be slightly different from my previous videos. In fact, I want to start with something like a confession. In this video essay, I wanted to address the question of whether the pure land is a real place or just a symbol for the enlightened mind. But when I tried to write the script, I couldn't really do it. Many times I felt like I had bitten more than I could chew. I made version after version of the script. I read books and commentaries on Pure Land Buddhism. I had long conversations with friends. I considered different ways of approaching the topic. And still, I couldn't really figure out what the right way to talk about it was. How to explain the Pure Land teachings, which supposedly only an enlightened person can understand in all their subtlety and how to do it in such a way that it would be accessible for a modern Western audience. I won't lie to you, it felt like quite a big challenge. But I also felt like I couldn't give up. If there was any chance that these videos could contribute even a tiny bit to demystifying and making more accessible Pure Land ideas in the West, then I had to give it my best shot, inadequate as it may be. On the face of it, Pureland is the simplest method to understand and practice. It only requires one to recite the name of Buddha Amitabha with a sincere wish to be born in his pure land. That is enough. However, like a well-built watch, inside of a seemingly simple presentation lies hidden the entire mechanism of the teachings of the Buddha in all of their philosophical and psychological depth. As legendary 16th century monk Han Shan De Tsing said, in its totality, Pure Land reflects the teaching of Buddhism as expressed in the Avatamsaka Sutra, mutual identity and interpenetration of all and everything. The simplest method contains the ultimate, and the ultimate is found in the simplest. This, however, is also why it is so difficult to wrap one's head around it and so difficult to believe in. Yet this is also why many masters have given it a special place among the Buddha's teachings. Because everyone, from the dull to the wise, from monks to busy lay people, from beginners to expert meditators, can practice it and reap its benefits. Thus, it is also said that Pure Land may be the most effective method for the turbulent, confusing times of what is sometimes called the Dharma Ending Age, times when genuine spiritual guidance is hard to find, and the values embraced by the world conflict with spiritual development. Which is also why I thought it would be especially relevant to make these videos at this time. So, how could I speak about the Pure Land in a modern Western context without oversimplifying and misrepresenting it, but also conveying its connection with the rest of the Buddha's pragmatic and practical teachings on human nature and liberation? This second video is my continuing attempt at grappling with this question. It wasn't always easy, but I really hope that you will enjoy it and derive some small benefit from it. So back to the animating question of this video. In part one of this series, I said that one way of understanding Amitabha Buddha is as a representation of our own original Buddha nature, our capacity for waking up, and that calling on him is a way of directly connecting to the nature that we all possess. So I guess the million dollar question is, 
Does that mean that the pure land is nothing but a metaphorical way of speaking about a mind that has been purified? Or is it a real place one actually goes to? But of course, like ontological soldiers hiding inside a wooden horse, inside of that seemingly harmless question lies hidden a whole host of assumptions about reality and about ourselves. So let's follow Socrates' lead and turn the question around. What is a real place? No, really, what is a real place? We are so used to thinking that we are a person existing in a world that exists out there that the question seems absurd and unnecessary. My house is a real place. The world is a real place. The universe is a real place. In phenomenology, this is called the natural attitude or naive realism, taking at face value the picture of the world and ourselves that is handed to us by our mind and our senses. But what is my house? What is the world? What is the universe? Aren't these just ways in which we organize our experience? Ways of bringing together a bunch of stuff we see, smell, hear, touch, taste, and think about and group them under some sort of label? A label that we are so accustomed to using that we forget it was a label to begin with. Isn't even the universe a concept in our minds? But don't think about this intellectually or abstractly. I encourage you to pause the video and really ask yourself right now in your experience, can you find evidence of outside reality that is not mediated by a mental interpretation? But just to clarify, this isn't an ontological point. The point is not to make a statement about how things really are or about what really exists. The point is merely to note the simple, straightforward fact that the experience of a real place is always happening in the mind and is always mediated by mental interpretation. Where else could anything be experienced? If this wasn't the case, by the way, then dreams wouldn't feel as real as they do. But more on dreams later, let's come back to the pure land. Perhaps when we hear about the pure land teaching, our first reaction is that it sounds kind of like a fairy tale. But the point is that we are already inside of a fairy tale. A painful, chaotic fairy tale that our mind is constructing moment after moment without us even noticing it. Our mind itself builds the world we inhabit, and then it kind of forgets it has built it. It would be kind of funny if it weren't so tragic. In Yogacara, this is called Vishnapti Matra, sometimes translated as mind only, but perhaps more accurately as the closure of consciousness. We are all the time chasing after the beautiful and the pleasurable and running from the ugly and the painful without realizing that without our minds projecting these qualities onto things, there would be no beautiful, there would be no ugly. Is a woman or a man beautiful? To a hungry wolf, they are an appetizing dish. To a scared rabbit, they are a terrifying monster. Is a corpse repulsive? To a vulture, it's a decadent banquet. To a worm, a luxurious mansion. There is an analogy that compares our unenlightened state to that of a dog that's biting a bone. It bites it so hard that its gums start to bleed. The dog thinks he's tasting the delicious bone marrow, but in fact, there is no marrow, he's only eating his own blood. In the same way, we chase after the objects of our desires, thinking they are separate, when in fact, we are still within the realm of our mind's projections. So you can't say that the pure land is a fairy tale, and you wouldn't be totally wrong. It is, after all, something that happens only in the mind. But remember that in that case, it is as much of a fairy tale as the life you are leading right now. But the key point is that there is an all-important difference. Because the pure land is a fairy tale whose purpose is not to deceive, but to awaken. Not to create suffering, but to relieve it. It is a fairy tale built out of wisdom and compassion, not out of ignorance and selfishness. In the eyes of the Buddha, we are right now like people who are asleep and dreaming. Buddha literally means one who is awake. 
Picture a dreamer that was dreaming she was locking down in a bog. Foul smells meeting her nostrils, slimy fish wriggling against her legs. And as sometimes happens in dreams, suddenly found herself transported to a beautiful, bright city with intricate towers and spires rising to the sky and gold-gilded palaces adorning the streets. The dreamer may wonder, where did the swamp I was just in go? It felt so real. To her, this is all completely real. Where is all the water? What happened to all those trees? Where did the fish and birds go? And where did these buildings even come from? Who built them? But for the person who is awake, these questions make no sense. In fact, no rational answer can be given to them because they are based on a false premise to begin with, on a mistaken apprehension of reality. The swamp cannot have gone anywhere, and the city cannot have come from anywhere because there wasn't a swamp to begin with, just like there isn't really a city either. So once again, is the Pure Land a real place? Or is it a representation of the pure mind? Yes. According to the tradition, it is a real place one goes to after death. And on this point, no serious exposition of the pure land would be complete without mentioning the Jintu Chuan genre of literature. Compilations of accounts of practitioners, lay and monastic, men and women from ancient times up to the present believed to have been born in the pure land. You can draw your own conclusions from this, but these rebirth accounts, of which there are hundreds if not thousands, tell a brief biographical account of the person, and then usually they speak about the special signs that occurred at their time of death. The person may know the day and time of their passing ahead of time, or they may exhibit a joyful and peaceful countenance after dying, or they may see Amitabha coming to meet them or an unexplainable fragrance may fill the room the person is in, or family members may have dreams of the person in the pure land. So yes, for the tradition, the pure land is a real place one goes to after death. Yet that doesn't mean for a second that it is not constructed by the mind. And yes, most definitely, the pure land is a symbol for the enlightened mind which ultimately is not far away nor only accessible after death. But that doesn't mean it isn't an experience as actual as this dream that we call the real world. And also, it is neither of these. In the ultimate analysis, all words and concepts are nothing but attempts at describing what in reality are infinitely interconnected, perpetually changing, momentarily abiding phenomena. But ourselves don't really like this, so they cling to the symbols that provide us with the reassuring illusion of a permanent, abiding essence in us and in everything else. However, truth can only be pointed to, never really described. As the Chan saying goes, it is an experience beyond words and language, beyond thought. Anything we can say about it is at best a skillful means, an aid pointing us in the right direction. But if we said this to a Pure Land teacher, I think they would ask us, are we able to let go of everything? Can we really see everything as empty? Can we endure the patience of the state where no mental objects arise? And if we are honest with ourselves and realize that that's kind of a tall order, the world is really engrossing and the ancients didn't even have TikTok. Emptiness is kind of scary. Our egos are very powerful. Then they may ask, why be so afraid of relying on a fairy tale? After all, doesn't the fact that after we finish this video, we will go back to our lives communicating our chosen identities on social media, mulling over our problems, worrying about our social status and about whether we are good enough. Doesn't all of this prove that in the end, we still love fairy tales? Part 1 and 2 of this series have been rather theoretical, examining the philosophical aspects of the Pure Land teaching. However, in the third part of the series, I want to focus on the more practical aspects, 
What specifically does it involve practicing the Pure Land teachings? <laughs> 